Welcome everyone. I'm Congresswoman Kathy Castor coming to you from uh, Tampa, Florida. Uh, very interested in today's topic. Uh, I'm so glad that many of you join us today. Uh, we're using Zoom to conduct the briefing uh, here with the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis, the Democratic members and experts are joining by video. Uh, we are uh, very interested in any public comments. I hope we, you will find a way to comment through, through Twitter on uh, today's briefing. Uh, for the folks who are on, please remain on mute until you are ready to speak. And as with in-person meetings, the members will control uh, their microphones. Members can be muted by staff only if there's inadvertent background noise. And at, after we hear from all, our presenters, I'll ask who has questions. Uh, so please raise your hand or post a question in the chat and then we'll work down the list. Uh, but I wanted to offer some, some opening remarks uh, because the, the costs of climate, they're growing exponentially. And I feel it here in a coastal community, folks inland are feeling it, but the late, some of the latest research really provides a dire warning uh, for everyone across the globe on the urgency with which we must act. The new research that we're going to learn about today points to alarming consequences of overshooting the temperature goals we have under the Paris Climate Agreement, including possible rapid melting of Antarctic ice. Rising seas and more severe coastal storms and floods are driving up risks and insurance costs while eroding property values in some of the riskiest areas. areas. These factors combine to exacerbate historical patterns of development policies that often push working class and communities of color toward uh, some very risky flood prone areas. But today, the flood risks are really pushing communities across America, across the globe, to uh, very serious consequences. Disinvestment, deferred maintenance of infrastructure, the impact on public assets, underinsurance, all of these things set the stage for uh, far deadlier and costlier storms. So this afternoon, we will hear from two experts at the forefront of helping communities and the nation better under, understand and act on the threats of sea level rise. Dr. Robert DeCanto and Ms. Nancy Watkins. Uh, Dr. DeCanto is professor of geosciences and the co-director of the School of Earth and Sustainability at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, where he studies polar climate change, the response of ice sheets to, to the warming climate, and coastal impacts of sea level rise. Dr. Kanto serves on the international science advisory, on many international science advisory boards, and is a lead author for the Interne Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Previously, he held research positions at the US National Center for Atmospheric Research and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Welcome, Dr. Kanto. Ms. Nancy Watkins is a principal and consulting actuary with the international actuary and consulting firm Milliman, where she leads a practice that specializes in climate resilience, uh, insure tech and catastrophic property risk. At the forefront of innovation in flood risk, her team provides state-of-the-art tools, technology, and analysis to insurers, reinsurers, and stakeholders in the flood insurance space. Ms. Watkins serves on the United Nations Capital Development Fund's Climate Insurance Linked Resilient Infrastructure Finance Working Group to pilot climate ad adaptation financing for emerging markets and least developed countries. Uh, so thank you for being here, Ms. Watkins. Let's start with Professor Kanto. Thank you, Professor Kanto. You, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair Castor and members of the House. I am going to share my screen. And like most card-carrying scientists, I couldn't help but put some PowerPoint slides together for you. 
Um, this backdrop is what coastal New England is beginning to look like more frequently during big winter coastal storms. I, um, I'm going to give you a rundown on a paper that was just published as we just heard on Wednesday in Nature. And because I've um, served on the United Nations IPCC, my remarks at the end are going to be hopefully policy informative and not prescriptive. So I think the takeaway message from the science is going to speak for itself. So we've been framing um, what the big ice sheets might do in the future. We'll talk about those ice sheets in a moment. Sort of thinking um, along the lines of the implications for the Paris Climate Agreement and either meeting or exceeding those temperature targets of plus 1.5 degrees Celsius, plus, plus two degrees Celsius relative to pre-industrial times or something warmer than that and what happens. So, I can advance my slide here. Beautiful. So a, a quick overview. Sea level is rising. It's rising today. Over the last decade or so, it's been rising at a rate of about 3.6 or so millimeters per year. But it's really important to note that the rate is increasing. There's an acceleration in sea level rise. The main drivers, at least over the last few centuries, have been a combination of the oceans absorbing heat with global warming, warming up, expanding, and the melting of land ice. So glaciers all around the world in, in mountain areas and the big ice sheets on Greenland and Antarctica. And what's really important point to drive home is that in um, maybe around 2005, 2000 or six or so, land ice, the melting of glaciers in the ice sheets on Greenland and, and Antarctica began to overcome the contribution to sea level rise from the warming of the ocean. So there's been a, a shift in the Earth system in a sense. And this is leading to this acceleration in the rate of sea level rise. Now, we're particularly interested in this shift toward a land ice contribution to sea level rise because there is so much potential sea level rise locked up in the Greenland and the Antarctic ice sheets. Today, Greenland is contributing more to sea level rise than the Antarctic ice sheet. But you can see here the amount of ice that is resting on the Antarctic continent is the equivalent of 57 meters or almost 200 feet of sea level rise. So even a very small change in that system would have potentially devastating consequences worldwide. I think this is a powerful image um, just in terms of the scale of the system that we're, we're going to be talking about for the rest of of um, my um, short briefing to you. Okay, so as, we, as I just said, Greenland is a bigger contributor today to sea level rise than Antarctica. Antarctica is the bigger ice sheet by far, almost eight times more um, potential to drive sea level locked up in the Antarctic ice sheet. This is a map showing the change or the thinning of the ice sheet itself. In the red are places where the ice sheet is losing mass. The blue where it might be gaining a little bit due to increased snowfall. So you can see that the mass loss is concentrated in this part of Antarctica and that ends up being important actually for the United States for a reason I might end up telling you about if we have a few extra minutes at the end. This is West Antarctica. And that part of Antarctica is special because the ice sheet is actually sitting, resting on rock that is in some places 2,000 meters below sea level. The ice is so thick, it's resting on the seafloor, but it is way below sea level. And the other reason why Antarctica is special and difficult to develop computer models to see what it might do in the future is because the edge of the whole continent, almost all of it, is in direct contact with the ocean. So it's the change in the ocean around Antarctica as well as the atmosphere that impact it. Now, this is just an, uh, a typical glacier in Antarctica that's flowing from the ice sheet out into the ocean. And what's really important to note is that as that ice sheet flows from land out into the sea, 
it forms a floating tongue of ice. There's an apron of these so-called ice shelves that are floating and they fringe the ice sheet. And they have a very important role. If they bump into features on the seafloor, then the flowing ice that is going out into the sea is actually resisted. These floating ice shelves actually provide some resistance. They slow down the flow of the ice from the high elevations down into the sea. We call this buttressing and it's just like the essence of a flying buttress on a Gothic cathedral. These ice shelves slow the flow and they provide structural support for the edge of the ice sheet. Now what's happening today is that warm water under these ice shelves are beginning to thin them from below. Now in the future, what we're worried about is that if that thinning from the warm waters beneath in, in continues or might increase and it starts to become warm enough in the summer over these ice shelves so that we start to get some rain and just some warm temperatures above freezing that start to make melt water, ponds begin to form on these ice shelves, that that could be bad for those ice shelves. And if they disappear, then we no longer have this buttressing and the ice will begin to flow into the sea faster. So back in 2002, this is an image of, a, of one ice shelf. It's out here on the Antarctic Peninsula, which is essentially, it's the most equatorward part of the continent. We think of it as the banana belt of Antarctica. And it turned out that this, this summer, it was anomalously warm. And this is an image of this ice shelf. This is roughly, oh, maybe the size of the state of Rhode Island. It's huge. And you can see these glaciers flowing into the ice shelf. These dark little bits on the ice shelf are meltwater because it was so warm that summer. And what happened was that meltwater got into crevasses and crevices and in a very short amount of time, the ice shelf broke up. And when it broke up, it was no longer providing resistance to the flow of the ice streaming down these glaciers and they sped up. The biggest one in this image, the Crane Glacier, sped up by three times. The ice started to flow three times faster out into the sea. And it not only flowed faster out into the sea, it actually began to back up into its fjord. So what you're going to see now is an attempt to model with computers um, these sorts of dynamics where we actually incorporate the flow of the ice, the interaction between the ice sheets, the surrounding ocean, a warming atmosphere, rainwater getting into cracks in the ice sheet to see what might happen to the ice sheet in the future. So this is a snapshot from a model simulation of the ice sheet. This is the Antarctic ice sheet. This was the ice shelf that we just talked about that broke up back in 2002, allowing ice to flow faster into the ocean. That event back in 2002 did not drive catastrophic sea level rise because there isn't that much ice out here on the Antarctic Peninsula to drive devastating sea level rise. What we're worried about is that kind of situation becoming more widespread across this massive continent. Those ice shelves really being the key. When they're lost, fast flow and even calving, the breaking, the fracturing of ice at the, at the ice edge falling into the sea um, is what we're concerned about. Now I've drawn, I've, drawn, I've drawn a red box over this sector of Antarctica where I just noted a few minutes ago, this is where most of the action is today. This is the part of the ice sheet that is retreating today. So what we've done now is look at scenarios of future warming where we either follow the current pledges, the so-called NDCs, the Nationally Determined Contributions um, or Commitments, to, our pledges to um, reductions in future carbon emissions versus a scenario where we um, follow initially the Paris pledges but when the world reaches 1.5 degrees C, one of the, the Paris Agreement aspirations, we say, okay, we're not gonna let the world get any warmer and we're going to see what happens to the ice sheet. And in a plus 1.5 degrees C scenario where we're warming up toward 1.5 degrees C, but no warmer, this is the rate of sea level rise that's coming from Antarctica. It's a gradual increase because there is some warming, the ice sheet contributes more to sea level rise, but it really sort of behaves like it is today. It's contributing to sea level rise for sure, 
but it's not doing anything dramatic. This is plus two degrees Celsius, where the world is warming up, following the current pledges. But when we hit two degrees, maybe roughly about here, it doesn't get any warmer than plus two degrees C. And it's interesting, the result is almost the same as the plus 1.5 degrees scenario, where the ice sheet is not really doing anything too, too scary. There's some increase in the contribution of sea level rise, which would be problematical for many places around the world. But it's when we jump to allowing the Earth to warm up to plus three degrees C, where there's a huge uptick in the amount of retreat, the rate of retreat of the ice sheet and its contribution to sea level. In the plus three degrees C scenario, and I think it's pretty clear to see the difference between this versus this, and then this big jump here, this is the rate of sea level rise just from Antarctica alone. And if we look over here on the left-hand side, of the graph, it's about a half a centimeter or five millimeters per year. Today, the ice sheet is contributing roughly a half a millimeter to sea level rise per year. And in the plus three degree scenario, it jumps up a factor of 10. So we've crossed some sort of tipping point associated with the loss of some of these ice shelves. And the way this plays out on a map, there is the ice sheet, the way it looks essentially today, there it is in the year 2100, where the ice sheet has now added 15 centimeters to global average sea level rise, perhaps as high as 27 centimeters. But when we look out beyond a 2100 time horizon, in the long term, this is what happens. Most of the interior of the West Antarctic ice sheet has now been lost. It's collapsed, fast flow out into the ocean, the, the ice shelves, these really light colors are the floating ice shelves. There's just not enough there. They're not strong enough to slow down the flow of the ice into the ocean. Now, there's a tipping point. That's take home point number one that we think that we've identified somewhere between plus two and plus three degrees. If we do approach plus three degrees and the scenario that just played out in these maps begins to happen, can we stop it? And so I think a somewhat unique piece of this work is that we looked into what if we initially, this is carbon dioxide increasing following the, the current pledges. What if we at some point in the future develop the technology that is not proven, this is really science fiction because we don't know how we would do this yet. But what if we could actually dial back atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations, pull CO2 out of the atmosphere. And what we did was we said, well, what if we develop that technology and start that technology in the year 2030? What if we don't get that technology sorted out until 2030 or 2040 or 2050? So we looked to see how long we could have an overshoot of two degrees C and then cool the world back down again to see if we can stop the ice sheet from retreating. And it turns out, this is a complicated graph, but in words, what we find it found was once the rapid retreat really becomes entrenched into the behavior of the ice sheet, even a, a very fast reduction in CO2, a return toward pre-industrial temperatures does not stop the retreat. It just keeps going. Once that train is rolling down the track, it just keeps going. If, if the carbon dioxide reduction were to begin any later than 2070, it really doesn't have much of an effect at all. So this means that there's a serious commitment to um, fast sea level rise coming from Antarctica if we wait too long or exceed these Paris Agreement aspirations and have an overshoot in temperature above plus two degrees C. So this is the bottom line to sort of sum things up. In the year 2100, there's a big jump when we go from a plus 1.5 or a plus two degrees C world to a plus three following the current pledges. We um, almost double the amount of sea level rise coming from Antarctica, 15 centimeters would be problematical. A half a centimeter of sea level rise per year. Remember today's sea level rise is less, less, than, less than that. It's 3.6, four or so um, millimeters per year. So imagine half a centimeter per year would be very difficult to manage, but what if we went to higher emissions? What if we don't manage to even follow the pledges and do something 
um, higher in terms of emissions. This is a more extreme scenario, the so-called so RCP 8.5, a more extreme emission scenario where we're basically just going business as usual with a fossil fuel intensive future economic growth plan. Instead of 15 centimeters, the value jumps up to 34 centimeters of sea level rise just from Antarctica. And this would be in addition to Greenland's contribution, glaciers, thermal expansion, but I think what's really striking is it's really the next century. And I would urge all of you that we need to be thinking beyond the year 2100. That's only 80 years away. It's one generation away. Infrastructure that we're building today will still be around in the, in the, in the 22nd century. And if we look at these sea level rise values, particularly for an extreme emission scenario, we're talking about multiple meters of sea level rise potential coming from the Antarctic ice sheet. In the year 2300, we're suggesting it's possible we could see on the order of 10 meters, 30 feet or so of sea level rise. This would essentially remap the global coastline. So, so to wrap up, the, the, the take home, I think powerful messages here are that um, we're finding, this is based on the science and the findings from, from this work, are that allowing global temperatures to rise above two degrees Celsius relative to pre-industrial is going to significantly increase the risk of triggering these rapid processes in Antarctica that could drive fast sea level rise as much as half a centimeter per year just from the Antarctic ice sheet in the year 2100. So I would say, you know, the take home message is that the current pledges that would get us to close to plus three degrees C by 2100 are not sufficient. We looked at overshooting. Could we turn the clock back? Could we reverse these processes once they kick in? It turns out that we believe based on this work that these processes would be irreversible. Even very fast carbon dioxide reduction, carbon geoengineering, unproven technology at this point even if we had it, doesn't look like it would save the day. Sea level rise would continue for hundreds to maybe even thousands of years. And the reason why it's such a long-term commitment is that remember, it's all about those buttressing ice shelves, that apron of ice that has to reform to slow down the flow of the ice from the interior of the continent. And until the oceans cool back down again to allow those ice shelves to reform, we, the ice sheet just keeps retreating. It's much easier for these ice shelves to break up, we're finding, than it is for them to regrow. So this, there is a serious commitment. Now, on human time scales, the sea level rise from Antarctica will be permanent. I would say that overshooting two degrees based on this in the permanence of the changes, overshooting two degrees is not an option. And, and because we don't know exactly where these thresholds are, staying closer to 1.5 would be a lot safer. If we do something above the current pledges, then we're talking about potential rates of sea level rise that would be essentially catastrophic where we would be remapping our coastlines and we would be talking about managed retreat versus engineering to try to protect um, our coastlines. The implications I would say for, um, for vulnerable populations Social, socially vulnerable populations, national defense even um, are, should be pretty obvious if, we, um, if these sorts of events were to begin to play out where we would be talking about meters of sea level rise on century sort of time scales. And I yeah, should really just emphasize that the, the Antarctic component to sea level rise in the future is still, it remains the single greatest source of uncertainty. There is a lot of uncertainty in this. These, the precise temperature thresholds that could trigger these processes or how fast these processes could actually deliver ice to the ocean, um, we still have a lot of work to do. So this paper that just came out is by no means the final word. We're already thinking about the next steps, how to improve things to try to narrow the range of uncertainty. And I you know, would say that as we'll he probably hear about next, this broad uncertainty in understanding this um, is gonna require a flexible approach to adaptation. Um, 
if, if we delay in mitigation, in the mitigation of CO2 emissions, and you know, massive retreat does begin, um, it's possible that the capacity for coastal engineering would be overwhelmed. At the same time, um, because we don't know just how much sea level might rise in the year 2100 or 2200, again, I think we have to have plans in place that are adaptable to a wide range of future outcomes because the high end numbers that are sort of at the extreme end of the tails of these distributions of these simulations are, are big, they're very high. And I will, I will stop there. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dr. DeCanto, for your very sobering uh, summary of your scientific research. Uh, next, we'll turn to uh, Nancy Watkins. Ms. Watkins, you are recognized for your presentation. Thank you, Chair Castor, and thank you, committee members, for inviting me. Um, my job as an actuary is to figure out what risk means in a given context, how to quantify it, and who ends up with it. So today I'm gonna to share some thoughts about why insurance is important. What's the current flood situation in the US? What uh, do we see as the threat of sea level rise on coastal communities? And some suggestions about ways that Congress can start to address these threats. So with respect to the importance of insurance, um, insurance is basically the promise to pay uncertain losses in return for a certain premium. We call that risk transfer. When you've transferred your risk through insurance, you don't need to understand it, you don't need to measure it, you just need to budget for the premium. So currently our economic forecasts and um, how people make decisions, if you're a real estate investor, a lender or an individual, we assume that there's long-term stability of insurance availability and affordability. What happens then when insurance is not widely available or affordable? We've seen this before in the US, the real estate market freezes, property values drop, and there's a downstream impact on business and community investments and then taxes for the community. So how this relates to the current flood situa situation in the US, right now Milliman estimates that only 5% of US homeowners have flood insurance today, mostly through the National Flood Insurance Program or NFIP. Uh, private homeowners insurance typically does not cover flood. There is a private market, but it's quite small um, and doesn't uh, cover very many people. So the current flood risk in the US is borne mostly by individuals in flood prone areas and then financial institutions like GSEs who hold most mortgage risk, not by insurance companies. Much of the risk is transferred to taxpayers through federal programs like subsidized NFIP policies, federal disaster aid or federally insured mortgages. And as long as the risk doesn't get too high, this can be an okay situation. However, as we know, flood risk is already very high. It's increasing rapidly and it might be unsustainable once you factor in sea level rise. So thinking about sea level rise, especially in light of Professor DeCanto's sobering presentation today, our biggest issue is that the flood risk is increasing due to climate change. We're already experiencing heavier precipitation, more severe coastal storms and sunny day flooding. Milliman did a study on the effect of sea level rise on residential flood risk in the US and looked at uh, countrywide storm surge flood losses projected at 2050 under two sea level rise scenarios. A median scenario, which is about a half meter of sea level rise by 2100 and a high scenario, which assumes about one and a half meters by 2100. They correspond approximately to RCP 4.5 and um, RCP 8.5. In our study, we estimated that over two thirds of metropolitan statistical areas or MSAs are uninsured for 90% or more of their expected flood losses with only 6% of MSAs insuring more than 30% of their flood losses. So most of this risk is retained by the community. Under our medium sea level rise scenario, total US storm surge losses increased an average of 21% across the country. The top 10 MSAs ranged from plus 32 to plus 50%. In a high sea level rise scenario, uh, the total US storm surge losses increased by an average of 66%, and the top 10 MSAs ra range from 100 to 200%. So where are these top 10 MSAs? Eight of them are on the East Coast between Georgia and New Jersey, and the other two are in Texas and Louisiana. 
So if uninsured damages and insurance premiums are already quite high in many coastal areas, they'll be significantly higher in 2050, which is the 30 year horizon that our study and many catastrophe models focus on. However, beyond 2050 is when sea level rise modeling shows the possibility of dramatic increases, as Dr. DeCanto has very well pointed out for us today. If his research uh, sh shows the, the, the rapid increase beyond 2050, our high scenario numbers could severely underestimate the actual changes in losses. So generally, this risk is not quantified in company balance sheets. But the business world is starting to factor climate change into their future investment decisions. Real estate investors, GSEs, and municipal bond rating agencies are investing in advanced climate modeling and analytics to identify areas where their long-term investments may be unattractive due to climate risk. In coastal communities where the flood risk is increasing and expected to get even worse, the long-term stability of insurance availability and affordability may be threatened. Real estate values will drop as insurance gets more expensive. Interest in business and real estate investment will decrease. The residents um, will move to more desirable areas if they can. The community tax bases will be eroded and the cost of borrowing will increase. The low income communities are likely to be hit the hardest. These are often built in the riskiest areas and they're also gonna have possibilities of urban flooding in urban areas. These are increasing from precipitation, development, and aging infrastructure. These communities have fewer resources to invest in infrastructure and maintenance, fewer options to, for residents to relocate, and they're less likely to have insurance. So this scenario is likely to cause migration of entire communities across the, especially across the coast. Milliman did a pilot study of Miami-Dade and Broward counties and we identified 50,000 households in low income communities, which are in higher elevation areas who might be priced out due to climate migration. And then another 40,000 households in lower elevation areas who face the crisis of their neighborhoods disappearing with few options to move. So this scenario could play out gradually, but there's also a big possibility for entire markets to collapse quickly. So what would I say about this situation um, and, and in light of Professor DeCanto's paper? A certain amount of sea level rise and melting, it's already baked in, it's already going to occur, but the total amount is not yet certain and the time scale over which it, it occurs is also not yet determined. The financial consequences of sea level rise depend not just on the end state, but the time period over which the change happens. So we shouldn't fall into uh, thinking that a, a inevitability of, of catastrophe is uh, just something that means we can't do anything. We, there's no reason to be complacent and make things worse. No matter what sea level rise scenario is correct, the longer we wait to address the threat, the worse the impacts will be. So what are some strategies for Congress to address the sea level rise effect and, and the threats to coastal communities? My, my biggest suggestion is get a better understanding of future risk. In the US, we haven't quantified most of these risks in a meaningful way. Government needs to make models and future risk metrics part of planning and financial decisions across the board. We need to understand that the future is going to look very different than the past, and we must become conversant with risk and uncertainty in order to better navigate the future. We can't rely on existing processes or norms or metrics or just our gut experience to guide us. We need to direct our investments in better expertise, better modeling, and better data. The National Flood Insurance Program is launching Risk Rating 2.0 and that's gonna be a great starting point for future flood risk measurement and communication. We're gonna also need to reduce de dependence on widely used metrics like the 100 year event that are no longer relevant or sufficient. We'll need a unified dynamic evaluation framework for planning, better targeting and prioritization of need, and then we'll have the ability to do a robust cost benefit analysis to justify our actions will also have a realistic quantification of the failure to reduce risk. Once we have these models to guide our decisions, we'll be able to address climate risk more proactively and do the other things we need to do. First, I'd say shift away from the post-events response framework towards pre-event risk reduction measurements. We need to prioritize risk reduction over short-term pain avoidance when we're making our decisions. 
Next, we need to promote financial protection to allow better rebounding post-event. I really would encourage flood insurance take-up rates and fostering the private flood insurance industry where possible. Get insurance industry involved to solve the problem rather than just have the government take over the functions that are traditionally held by the private market. And last, educate people and communities on risk to drive better decisions. We're gonna need the government to help tell people what to expect as early as possible so they have more choices, better, less bad choices, I guess I'd say. Um, and they'll, they'll be less likely to lock in on, on poor decisions that they've made in the past. In conclusion, I greatly value the work the committee is doing to lead the way on climate and sea level rise. You're gonna need a range of experts to understand what's the best path ahead. Not just actuaries, but climate scientists, cap modelers, engineers, economists, financial experts, and community leaders. Milliman and, and my colleagues and I, are, we're happy to use our skills and our expertise to support your efforts. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Watkins. Um, I'm going to go right to Rep. Brownlee. She had her hand up early. Uh, Rep. Brownlee, you're recognized for five minutes for questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you both uh, for your uh, presentations. It's quite sobering information and scary with uh, and, and and all. So, I guess um, you know my first question. Um, really is uh, to Ms. Watkins in terms of some of your uh, recommendations and which I completely understand, which is, uh, you know, um, a better understanding of future risks and what we can do for pre-event risk reductions, as you said, and, um, and so forth. And so I guess my question would really be, you know, let's just say hypothetically Congress um, you know, took really big, bold, transformative action towards uh, the climate crisis. Um, you know, how, how does that factor into, you know, the risk assessments, um, et cetera? I mean, that would include, um, you know, resiliency and mitigation, as well as, you know, moving to, a, you know, a clean energy economy, you know, all of those things, if we were doing those kind of big, bold things, you know, what would that do to um, sort of the, the, the risk analysis in the short term and the long term? Do you have to see the results of it first or just the fact that uh, the government has taken action on those things? Does that make a difference? Um, that's a great question. Um, the way I would say it is um, you, you have uh, a current state of flood risk um, that, that's already been um, created. Uh, and that's right now risk rating 2.0 is, is, is going to be the best um, countrywide assessment of flood risk as it stands right now. Um, if, if the uh, risk were, were reduced through some kinds of mitigation measures, um, say we're talking about elevating houses, we'd be able to measure right now what is the reduced uh, impact of losses on those houses. Um, so that, that's something that's very easy, already doable. Um, you know, improving levees or um, other types of infrastructure things, we could build in um, with engineering support. This is, this is once again, it's Almost every one of these is a multidisciplinary question, um, but we have a framework to model what would be the uh, reduction in the risk that we expect to happen. And then the risk that uh, we call at the tail, like the, the, the worst scenarios that may be unexpected, but that are also possible. And then how that factors into the um, premiums that uh, would be charged to transfer that risk. Um, so, we would, if we have, um, if we do um, emission reduction and sea level rise is reduced, we can measure the risk. At, basically, we can measure the risk at any point of sea level rise. So, so we can model any one of those things. Um, the models aren't just sort of a plug and play thing. Uh, it, it takes people who understand how to put multiple models together um, including a model like Professor DeCanto's. 
Um, but they're all uh, sort of a modular, they, they can be made in a modular fashion to answer the questions. Did, did I address your question properly? Yeah, you did. It sound, I mean, it sounds to me like what you're saying is that there are things easily measurable, like ra raising a home. Um, and um, then there are other, and that's, you know, once that's done, it's done. It's kind of fixed in time. And then there are other things that are going to have impacts over time um, and probably gradual in some sense. And those are you know, you're going to need other sort of modeling tools to sort of establish, you know, if we did 40 different things to, you know, impact the climate crisis, you know, is there modeling out there to really get, you know, get your arms around all, all of those things? There, there is the ability to do that modeling. There isn't a super model that just exists where you can right. say, computer, what happens if I do this and this yeah. and this? Yeah. But, but there, there's a framework now um, think of it like an iPhone. You can add the apps on there. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's it's the the old way of doing the uh, flood risk measurement was more like those dial phones with the curly cords that I chatted on when I was a teenager. You you, you can't you can't put Google Maps on there no matter what you do. So yeah, we yeah. now have a platform with risk rating 2.0 to allow that. If you yeah. wanted to ask a question like what happens if we make our storm drains bigger, you kind of need an engineering study to know things that. The models may not know, but then they could be built into the models and answer the question. Got it. Got it. Got it. I don't know, um, Madam Chair, if I have the room to ask for another question. I don't see a clock or anything, but if, I, if I'm done, I will yield back my time. Why don't we come back around? Why don't we come back All around right. to the rep casting? Actually, I'm going to have to leave because I have another I have another uh, hearing that I have to attend. So I I apologize, but um, do you want to do you want to ask a quick question? Just a very quick question. Yeah, so go ahead. The, the one um, uh, 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 professor, I had a question for you, and that is um, the modeling that you've just presented is I think is a modeling just based on you know Antarctica. Um, and I, I guess my question I'm asking, does the modeling include, you know, uh, when I, I, you know, when I think about my district, I'm a coastal district, we're uh, largely agricultural that is dependent on groundwater. Um, we have a large naval base right on our, our coast, um, obviously population living on the, on the coastline. Um, and um, so, Things you know, so sea level rise is, is ex extremely important, but there are other area variables like land sinking, you know, which is, um, you know, I think in my district, you know, when you talk about groundwater pumping and so forth, is is a really important issue. So I guess the question is, does the modeling include all of those sort of other elements? Great question. So we use these sorts of results. And we can incorporate them into a um, statistical model that is specific to a location or even a, maybe the, the scale of a whole state's coastline. So for example, we've developed, um, I, I just led a report for the city of Boston that has been expanded to the entire Massachusetts coastline that takes into account Greenland, Antarctica, mountain glaciers, the local land subsidence or the land going up and down. Um, and on top of that, we then look at storm surge statistics. And then we look to see if in the future, even if we have the same distribution of tropical storms and nor'easters, for example, in New England, on a backdrop of these higher sea levels now that are in this model, and this is not not that different from the sort of modeling in a way framework that um, Ms. Watkins just was telling us about. We can then look to see in the year 2050, not only how high the sea level will be and what part of Boston might be inundated, but how frequent a storm surge of a specific event might be, um, how often we would expect them every 10 years and how high they might be. And so that gives, I think, planners a little bit more um, meat to sink, sink, sink their teeth into in terms of making decisions about infrastructure. So absolutely, we take this global scale stuff and you just saw a, the Antarctic piece of a global perspective. And then we zoom down 
to a specific location. So we could do something like that for your district, for example. And that's happening all around the country. We did a similar report for Jerry Brown um, while he was still governor for the state of California. Terrific, thank you so much. And um, thank you, Madam Chair, for your indulgence. I appreciate it. And you yeah. Next, we'll go to Rep Kasten. Thank you so much. Um, I have questions for both of you, but I do, I can linger. So let me maybe just ask my first and then we can, uh, if we get a second round, can come back. Um, uh, Ms. Watkins, you are singing my love language, um, it, other than being <laughs> totally, other than being totally depressing. Um, the, I, I'm on the financial services committee and most of my climate efforts are around getting our banking regulators to treat climate change as a systemic risk, to build these stress tests, to build these models, to understand where the money's going to wash through. And um, I literally just before this call finalized conceptual text on a rewrite of the NFIP. And I've, I've just asked my staff that uh, hopefully we can, we can impose upon you and get some thoughts. We've, we've mostly been thinking about structures to make sure that where land is better off put in, in permanent non-development and acting as a buffer that we don't keep rebuilding in that area and trying to craft some of the incentives. And I'd, I'd welcome your input on it. My, my, my question for you is your comment about um, wanting to get the private insurance industry more involved. And I'd, I'd, I'd like just to hear how you think about that because my, maybe this is just my simple math head, but it seems to me that insurance works well for things that are rare, expensive, and unpredictable. And, and flooding, is, flooding is only one of those and getting more and more expensive by the day. And it's just very hard for me to conceptualize of a way that puts a, an appropriate statistical price on flood risk. Um, okay, I, I've got Oopie, you. But I, okay, I, I, I got I got you freezed um, after flood oh. risk. And so, can you restate the question? Just oh, I'm oh, I'm I'm sorry. We're just asking how it, it conceptually. How do you imagine that you would have a, a private actuarial view of flood risk, given as those risks are are neither uh, neither rare nor unpredictable. Um, you know, because the, you know, the NFIP is going to be permanently insolvent. We understand that. But anything that actually prices appropriately, it seems to me, is going to be, um, uh, you know, essentially condemning anyone in low lying areas not to have houses. Well, I, I guess I wouldn't see it as bleak as that. Um, but uh, I, the, 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 the risk of flood is um, in magnitude about comparable to the risk of fire. Um, across the country. Now, obviously, there's some places like, as you know, uh, in California, we have a greater risk of fire than in, in other parts of the country. Mm -hmm. And there's other places with a higher risk of flood than we do. But uh, uh, the f flood is, is it, it, it used not to be insurable because it, it varies over such a short distance that you'd need very granular, very, very close information to understand how to manage and measure it. That's why the NFIP was created in the 60s. But in the past five years, there's been plenty of advancement in flood modeling um, that make that risk insurable. And the data is available to make that risk insurable. And we have many clients that are interested in offering flood insurance. The presence of an NFIP, if the, if the premiums are, are always gonna be low for the NFIP relative to what the market can charge, that will dampen the market. And that, that's gonna be true for any government residual market. If the government, uh, offers lower price um, comparable products, it's harder for the private industry to get in. But the NFIP is changing that um, and, and, and they are offering more actuarially sound rates. Those rates are capped for, um, for people who already have policies that were, that were lower priced in the past. Um, so I, I, just like any government program, I think the NFIP um, may end up subsidizing some risks, but that doesn't mean like they're only, they're only insuring 5 million uh, policies in the country, you know, there's 95% of the homeowners in the country don't have any flood insurance at all. And when you look back at events that, that, that had uh, flood losses, I mean, at least half of them aren't even required to, to buy flood insurance. So people need flood insurance. And, and I think the private industry would, uh, if, if they had the ability to charge actuarially sound rates, they would cover it. Now, will they cover rising costs that are known to rise at an affordable rate? Probably not. I mean, they, they, they could probably protect those, those homes, but whether those premiums will be affordable is a different question. 
And so I think that's why we're trying to focus on risk reduction and risk mitigation. But to your question about what the insurance industry can do, I think one major thing they can do is help communities evaluate how high their risk is and what are the best ways to, to mitigate it. I mean, if you think about some of the things that the insurance industry has done, underwriters laboratory to figure out what are the risks of products and how to certify the products and make sure that they can be insured. Um, the, the Institute of Highway Sa Sa Safety, they figured out the risk of automobiles and how to make autos more safe. So why can't they do that for flood risk or, or, or other risks um, and, and, and provide, they are experts in risk evaluation and reduction and getting that information into the hands of uh, people who need the, to, to, to be able to transfer the risk at affordable rates it requires the expertise to understand the best way of reducing risk. Um, I, I think the government can put a lot of good information out there, but in terms of financial evaluation, you, you, it would be good for the insurance industry to have a dog in the, on the hunt, you know, that to be on the ground, um, providing longer term coverage and um, applying their expertise to stay relevant um, in climate change. I mean, what? I guess what I what I struggle with, and I and then I'll stop because I know I've got a lot more time. Is and my wife works in the insurance industry, so I'm not I'm not opposed to insurance. It keeps keeps the roof over our heads. Um, <laughs> the, but you know, if we have regions, you know, you know, coastal cities where we know that you know the sea level rise is basically going to it's it's insurmountable. You know, Miami Beach, parts of New Orleans. Um, setting aside whether this is a federally subsidized insurance-like product or a private insurance product, it's hard for me to conceptualize why an insurance product is the right tool to something that's really a disaster management problem. Oh, it might not because, be. Because, because it's not a, it just, it's, at some point, this is not something where, like I said, it's not, it's not rare and unpredictable. It's extremely predictable and we know exactly where it's gonna hit. And we right. know what the damage is going to be, and so the, the, I think it's a struggle. Anyway, let me uh, let me stop talking because I know um, uh, Congresswoman Bonamici is still in the queue, um, and, and our chair maybe as well. Yeah, and, and I I like this conversation, um, Rep. Kasten, uh as part of the flood insurance reform bill that that it passed out of the House uh, the last go round. It included a flood insurance modernization and parity. Uh, section that I authored that was to help encourage private insurers to get into the flood insurance market. And the way I've always thought about it is we, because we have so many uh, homeowners and consumers who go bare when they should be covered, I think the, the private insurance industry would help us grow the pool and just basic insurance the more people you have in the pool, the, then the, you can spread the risk in a greater way. So I'm gonna, since you're focused on a rewrite, I'm gonna send that language over to you. Uh, and I'd be interested in, in your thoughts. And I'll probably ask Ms. Watkins a little bit more about it, but we'll go to Rep. Bonamici now. Uh, thank you. I'm appreciating the conversation as well. I represent a district in a Northwest Oregon where we have had similar conversations and analogous conversations with regard to uh, the tsunami and inundation zone. Uh, we saw uh, after the 2011 earthquake in Japan, we had tsunami here in, uh, in Oregon, but if we have near shore tsunami, uh, because we're overdue for a, a significant earthquake off the Cascadia subduction zone, we're in really big trouble. But I really wanted to um, ask Dr. Um, DeCanto. Um, so, so I co-chair the House of Oceans Caucus. I also represent a coastal district. Um, so I'm very concerned about these issues. Uh, our coastal economy is very critical and it, not just because of you know, the fishing industry, but also tourism. I, I, so I appreciate the urgency of, of your research. My sort of takeaway from your testimony and your recent paper is that the Antarctic sea level rise becomes essentially unstoppable if temperatures increase by two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels by mid-century, you showed in your testimony, I think very persuasively with your graph, what happens if the increase is three degrees. Um, I also wanna underscore your finding um, that warming ocean temperatures are actually preventing new ice shelves from emerging. Um, and, and also I wanna thank you for the map, um, for, for, for visual learners, especially looking at the way you had um, 
the United States and Antarctica, um, I think people really need to grasp the scale of this and that's hard to do without really understanding. I, I had the opportunity several years ago to go to Antarctica with the National Science Foundation and members of the Science, Space and Technology Committee. And you really, you know, you don't get the scale and scope of it um, without really understanding, you know, and standing there and looking at the glaciers and watching them melt. Um, so, so I wanted to ask you, how is the marine ice cliff instability, how is that exacerbated by warming ocean temperatures? And also, do we need more research to really fully understand the effects of ice cliff collapse? Do we need more research or just more, more modeling? How, how do we understand? No, we need more basic research. It, we're still representing those processes in a very simple way. And we really need investment. We need scientific interest, which is growing and we need more investment because that is the one mechanism that has the biggest, that is the wild card in terms of the rates. If to get to 10 meters of sea level rise in the year 2300 requires that process. My group and myself personally think that it is, it is, it is a relevant process because we observe it happening in places in Greenland today they're just not big enough to have a huge global impact on this kind of scale. And so we're really just kind of transforming some of those observations into a model and then applying it to Antarctica and then saying, hey, if these processes are going to turn on in Antarctica, they have the potential to have catastrophic sea level consequences. So I, there has been a recent investment, the um, United States National Science Foundation and the UK's NERC um, teamed up and they have a program that's targeting one particular, I don't know if you remember me showing some maps of the change in the ice sheet itself. And I said, this is the part of the ice sheet that really produces the bulk of the sea level rise. Yes. Well, there's a, there's a concerted effort right now. The US and the UK are collectively, they've gotten together and they're studying it to their best of ability. But there are very few groups like mine doing this kind of work. And, that's part of the uncertainty. And it's the ice cliff instability that, you know, that we, that, that term was coined in a, our previous paper like this back in 2016. And uh, there are a few groups that are working on the details of those processes, but they're still very uncertain. Some folks like my colleague, Richard Alley and co-author are worried that in the future, that mechanism could even drive faster rates of sea level rise than, than we are anticipating from the, these models. That, that's really helpful. And Representative Cast and I both serve on the a science based and technology committee that has jurisdiction over NSF and research. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll be following that closely. And um, Ms. Watkins, real quickly, you know, Dr. DeCanto's research provides a, a, a global picture, which is really critical, but sort of on the, the local level, um, will you talk about what current gaps there are in sort of actionable information about sea level rise that coastal communities need? You know, like for land use and siting decisions, how can they access the, the information they need uh, to make these decisions and how can Congress help address the gaps in information? That's a big question. <laughs> um, I keep getting calls from people in coastal communities like Virginia, um, the governor's office has a coastal planning committee that for example, um, and they are struggling to even understand whether how private flood insurance works um, and how to apply the, the you know, you don't want coastal communities to have to hire companies like mine and, and, and have local cat modelers and climate scientists. I mean, they, they can't afford this. And so th this is where I think the insurance industry could help. If there was some sort of mechanism where um, a certain level of protection for a coastal community uh, was involved for, I don't know, infrastructure uh, financing, um, getting, or, or for development, um, get, taking a longer term view and having like working with the insurance industry to figure out how to finance the future risk on this would mean that they would have some expert resources come to bear. I mean, to, to Representative Kasten's point, some communities are just going to have to move. I mean, and, and the federal government, I think, could, could help with the modeling in terms of 
cost benefit of, of you know, these severe repetitive loss properties and whether they should be bought out um, or, or whether we should keep paying to rebuild them or not. Um, but, but in terms of just planning for resilience, I, I, I expect FEMA and the National Flood Insurance Program are already doing a lot in this area and putting more resources in their hands to help with mitigation and communication and, and putting like, pilots um, and, and standards in the hands of local communities and figuring out how for them to think about building codes and land use in addition to, you know, to the tools of insurance and um, th that, are, that are already in play. Um, and, and I think linking into financial incentives, um, like Representative Caston was talking about lending, um, figuring out, ha having lenders evaluate whether um, a new development can actually have affordable insurance coverage for the lifetime of the asset. Right now, they, they don't care if they're selling the loans. This is not their risk anymore. They're going to shift it away from themselves. And that risk is never quantified anywhere, as far as I can tell. Um, so that was kind of a jumbly answer to your question. No, it was really helpful. And, and with regard to the some communities are just going to have to move piece, as you noted, uh, that disproportionately affects low-income communities, people of color, people who can move, can afford to move, uh, may have already moved and others can't. So there really is a, a disparity there that we need to address. Thank you so much. I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And I wonder, um, it's important, you know, we did spend some uh, time when we drafted our climate crisis action plan making some important recommendations to the other congressional committees. And we really need to now take this information and, and highlight those. One was reforming the federal flood risk standards to reflect the most recent projections of sea level rise and extreme rain events. The research now is coming in uh, fast and broad and all of the decisions that we make, we've got to build in the most current and up-to-date information. Uh, we've got a, we recommended to, to Congress strengthen the National Flood Insurance Program, enhanced mapping uh, of the current and future flood risk. Rep Bonamici is right, the local communities need those tools so that they can make informed decisions and help prevent uninsured losses uh, and it's really up to state leadership and local communities to hold firm on, on land use and understand that their risks and costs of certain land development decisions really are going to impact the, their way of life, their sustainable, their budgets, uh, taxes that we pay, stormwater fees that we pay. Um, so uh, Ms. Watkins, we're about to, to hammer out one of the largest transportation and infrastructure packages uh, that the Congress has ever handled. We're gonna make huge investments in clean energy, create jobs. It's a major job creator at, at a very important time. But what are your, rec what are your recommendations to us as we uh, draft that big jobs plan tied to transportation and infrastructure when it comes to, to mitigating risk and making smart investments of tax dollars? Well, I, I don't think I know enough about the whole topic to, to be very, very specific. Um, but I guess I would say whatever the government invests in, um, well, I, I would bifurcate how you treat existing uh, infrastructure versus future. Um, what what is, is there is there. And we have to mitigate whatever risk is involved um, on, on existing um, infrastructure in homes and communities. Um, we, we for, really for example, water plants, wastewater plants, they are there, they're serving, but boy, we can make them more resilient. Right, right. You, you have to protect what you have, um, but the, you have to be sure that there's no perverse incentives to build more in harm's way. Uh, and, and I think driving up the risk um, it is the first thing we have to stop doing M more development on the coast. You know, I, I think that is, is, is pretty important. And, and I think you can have higher standards on future development, things that are, are developed in areas that, that aren't developed yet, than you can have on what, what happens, you know, with existing infrastructure. 
Um, and and I'd, I'd say just making sure that the financing of it incorporates fairly robust scenario testing about future risk um, so, so that the, there's not some assumption that the risk is going to be static, um, especially if we're talking about sea level rise. I mean, this is not only a, a problem for sea level rise, it's a problem for wildfire as well. Um, you know, we're, I'm, I'm, I deal with wildfire on Thursdays and flood on Fridays. I mean, it's, it's, there's a lot of related problems coming from different perils. Um, so I guess I would say making sure that we're doing very robust um, and scientific uh, risk communication and financial modeling um, mm -hmm. before we invest the government's money in, uh, in anything, I mean, anything large. Um, and I, I, don't know, I, I don't know if that's even helpful, um, but I'm not sure how far you are down that path. Um, but I think that it has to go a lot farther than what I've, I've seen in the past. The, like the 100 year flood standard, that, that can't be the standard. Okay, that's, that is very helpful. And Dr. DeCanto, you, thank you so much for, for your research. You know, sitting here on coastal Florida, it's, it's, it really is quite sobering. But a, a lot of these uh, scientific terms are, are kind of hard to grasp for the, the non-scientists, for folks who are just trying to get through the day. Could you just tell us what, what's the difference between, okay, really doing everything in our power to invest in clean energy, reduce our carbon footprint? Uh, how much of that is baked in? How much change are we gonna see anyway? Uh, and kind of a do nothing approach. What does that mean to, to a state like Florida, folks who, uh, you bet they want to live on the coast, um, uh, but all up and down the, the eastern seaboard, uh, inland communities that are going to have riverine systems and estuarine systems uh, flood out. But what did, just in layman's terms, what does that, what does the future look like with uh, urgent action and what does it look like with the do nothing approach? So in my naive thinking about all of this, that's the kind of insurance that I'm thinking about because I, I, to me, this paper is actually encouraging and it has a positive outcome. If what fell out of the study was that if the world stays below 1.5 degrees C, we're going to have sea level will continue to rise as it is now. There will be increasing impacts, but hopefully and probably at a pace that we'll be able to adapt to and to work around. Plus two degrees C, it looks like we're still okay, but at plus three degrees or something higher, it becomes something that will be requiring the, um, the really sharp and clever ideas that we heard come from Ms. Watkins earlier, where we're talking about a completely different world where the rates of sea level rise become untenable. Um, we won't be able to cope from an engineering perspective. We will be talking about mass migration. We'll be talking about losing the Everglades in a short amount of time. So, you know, to me, this was a, a really super finding that the plus two degrees sea world was still, um, you know, it, we're going to have hardship. It, on our global coastlines. And you know, we're we're mostly focusing, I know, on the United States, but of course, even the current rate of sea level rise of three to five millimeters per year is becoming, you know, devastatingly impactful on some islands in the South Pacific and other coastlines around the world. But it it's the carbon mitigation to me is our greatest insurance policy. And this, I'm hopeful this work becomes something that you'll be able to use in those discussions. To me, the, the simplest solution is to try to keep as much fossil fuel in the ground, incentivize renewables and fast, create those clean jobs. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think that that's our best opportunity where we're not having to talk about these really wild um, issues where is it the insurance industry or is this just disaster relief 
that the, the federal government is responsible for on a massive scale. So reducing emissions still looks like, to me, in my naive, naive view, um, our, our best option. And in terms of a cost basis analysis, you know, that's not my field. I, I listen to my colleagues who work on that kind of thing. Um, I would think at the end of the day that mitigation, investment in renewables is going to be a whole heck of a lot more affordable than the outcome of doing nothing. Well, thank you very much. I think that's that's probably a good place to close out, but I want to give Rep. Kasten, I think he, he may have had another follow-up question. Chair, Cast uh, Chair Castor, sorry to interrupt. Um, I think uh, Representative McEachin is on the phone and I didn't know if he wanted to unmute and have an opportunity to ask some oh, questions. Oh, terrific. Rep. McEachin from Virginia, who, who Ms. Watkins, uh, he, Rep. McEachin um, introduced me to a lot of those folks in Virginia who are working on their uh, resiliency planning, and um, it was it was quite enlightening. Uh, Rep. McEachin, are you there? I am here, and I appreciate the uh, the the uh, work that these folks have done and continue to do. I'm really just learning today. You know, I don't know that I have any particular question, especially at this point. I think we've had a thorough discussion and uh, I'm appreciative of the opportunity, but uh, I've been uh, given some very sobering information and uh, I look forward. Well, thank you again, uh, Rep McEachin and, and um, the folks in, I remember- With you and the others on the committee to to convince our colleagues of what we need to do. Thanks again, Rep. McEachin. Uh, Rep. Kasten, did you have a follow-up question? Yeah, just uh, two, two short ones. And uh, I guess one, just to understand your, the, the mechanics of your model, uh, Dr. DeCanto, and, um, and, and then a science question. In your, I think early in your slides, you said that this was the sea level rise from the Antarctic melt. Does that mean that the actual sea level rise is higher than the numbers you showed? Um, and to the extent, like what what percent are we talking about? Because if you're saying Greenland's going faster, how much more dire is it than those numbers that you showed? So and this is just the Antarctic component. You're absolutely right. So we still are going to have sea level rise from thermal expansion and from Greenland and from the, the mountain glaciers. Um, but to put, put things in perspective, the, the most recent IPCC report that provided some projections on global mean sea level, th that was based on work that didn't include the processes that I talked about and explained to you today. So just based on work from just a few years ago. And in, in the IPCC's most recent report, they anticipated 12 centimeters of sea level rise coming from Antarctica in their worst case RCP 8.5 scenario in the year 2100, 12 centimeters. And this new work is suggesting that the number is might be closer to 34 centimeters. Mm -hmm. That's a big jump. So you mm -hmm. would essentially take this new study from Antarctica and add it on to the old estimates of the total sea level rise. So there would be a big uptick. Then the, the looking into the next century, a longer time scale perspective, that worst case scenario, we're saying that we might have to worry about another, an extra five meters of sea level rise coming from the Antarctic component. So I'm really glad you asked me that question. Okay. So I've just been talking about the Antarctic piece. Um, Greenland is, um, it, Greenland does produce more sea level rise in a warmer climate in the, in the studies. There was a, and a, this will be helpful at hopefully, there were two studies that were appeared in the same issue of Nature this week. The other one is by a, an English colleague and 80 or so other authors, Tams and Edwards. And they showed some other um, modeling of all the other components of sea level rise that will give you a perspective on the Greenland piece. Okay. I um, would look so, to the IPCC SROC, the special yeah. re report no. on the oceans in the cryosphere. And there's a nice table, very simple, that sums up Antarctica, Greenland, thermal expansion. And so you can see where things were okay. state of the art in 2019 
And then what happens when you add another an extra 20 or so centimeters from Antarctica based on this new work, what it gets us? Well, that's, 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 that's helpful for horrible reasons because your numbers didn't seem depressing enough to jibe with my, my recollection. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but now we have to add it to all the other ones. Um, uh, so the, the, the second science question is, and I've, I must say, I feel a little stupid because I've asked a lot of our witnesses this and they all answered me and I feel like I just never, I'm just too slow to understand the question, the answer. When we were at, at NOAA, um, whenever we were out there back in the pre-COVID times um, and they were, we were looking at all their historic weather history, if, if memory serves, the last time the planet was as hot as it is now, sea level was, was three to five meters higher, not, not three to four inches. And the... And I'm, I just would like to understand from you, I mean, we've got, you know, we've got time lags and of course this is going through. And I realized that, you know, in the prior waves, the, you know, the, the, the heat came first and the CO2 followed and now the lag is working in the direction, but over, over geologic time scales, not political time scales, the, why are we not, why are we talking in inches and not meters right now, but even before an extra degree? So I, I, you, you hit the nail on the head, and I think you grasp this perfectly. It's, it's a, it's time scale. So, 125,000 years ago, yeah, about 125,000 years ago, before the last ice age, we call it the last interglacial. It's when mm -hmm. climate, the system was similar to today in terms of temperature, and sea level the best estimates now are six to nine meters higher than today. So given enough time, a little bit of warming goes a long way in terms of sea level. And, and that actually has been, I think that that's a very powerful message that the ice sheets are indeed sensitive. And in fact, we use those targets to tune the physics in these ice sheet models. So we use the geological data that you're talking about. Actually, in a quantitative sense, we factor it in to make sure the models can reproduce those past sea level rises. If you go back to 3 million years ago, an, um, a geological epoch called the Pliocene, there were, at times, sea level was going up and down, but at times it was as, as high, we think, as about 20 meters higher than today. And what's important about the Pliocene was the Pliocene was warmer than today, a few degrees. Carbon dioxide was, they think, on the order of about 400 parts per million, which is essentially where we are today. So you're right in that with the CO2 that we have already put into the system on a very long time scale, and we're talking millennial sort of, you know, thousand year time scales, that there's the likelihood that there's going to be more steady uh, sea level rise, slowly emerging, continuing to modify our coastlines. But it's, we're going into a world now that hasn't seen a pace of warming like this before. It, because it's, it's greenhouse grass, gas driven, the greenhouse gas um, concentrations are going up very, very fast. And we're putting a lot of heat into the ocean in particular very quickly. And Antarctica is going to begin to feel that. And so we don't want to cross a threshold where this really super fast pace of sea level rise happens because these processes like marine ice cliff instability kick in. Because what we're finding is if we get reach that point, we won't be able to stop that train once it starts. And um, so we're ultimately talking about rates, I think, more than total magnitudes. But I, but I guess that my question, and and what, why I sort of have belabored this so long is to go from the geologic to the political timescales. Let's, let's stipulate we wave a magic wand. Um, we eliminate all CO2 tomorrow. The, we still have these issues of flooding. Um, we still have these sort of longer duration geologic events that are coming through. Yeah. And, and if we're thinking about, you know, about inches or maybe at the maximum feet of sea level rise, we're, it, it seems to me that if, if, if we're confident that it's really meters that are coming, then these questions of, you know, can we, can we build a sea level around this and slightly protect it as opposed to, do we just have to recognize that over, over time scales that eventually become political time scales, people are going to have to move, right? And, and we're going to have to grapple with the fact that some places that we think of as being, you know, states and 
and you know places that we have some cultural history to um, are, are going away. And it's just a matter of like, how it, it, we can all kick the can down the road, but is that, should we not be thinking that eventually the sea levels based on what we've already done are meters higher than they are right now? It, it's, it, either, it either happens in several thousand years down the road, or it happens on decades to a century sort of time scale. And that's really the difference. So gotcha. in 2011, I think was the first year Boston, downtown Boston saw its first nuisance flood. So-called, you've heard about nuisance flooding. Mm -hmm. Sunny day just happened to be a very high tide some sections of the of the, the the coast flooded by 2017 it was it i think it happened 20 year 20 times so it is true that even this slow um increase in sea level rise is going to have in some places exponentially growing impacts i just um i again am really encouraged by the fact that in these models a scenario with strict mitigation keeps us sort of in a world changing in terms of sea level rise, like what we're used to today versus something like we almost can't even imagine in terms of the pace. And that the, the jump to that other world is sudden. I'm frustrated myself that I can't tell you with greater certainty exactly where that jump is going to happen, but you know, I hope that we're wrong and it's at plus four degrees or plus five degrees and we have some more time to sort out our, um, our emissions issues. Right now, this study is saying it's somewhere between two and three degrees, which means that there should be a sense of urgency about carbon mitigation. Well, uh, thank you very much, Dr. DeCanto. Thank you very much, Ms. Watkins. I mean, it's clear climate change is causing uh, sea levels to rise and extreme weather to intensify. It's worsening the impacts, coastal, inland, uh, and urban flooding. Uh, we have unwise building and rebuilding in flood prone areas. And then that's con uh, compounded by the degradation of natural buffers as well. But we have uh, the tools. We now have a lot of the scientific research that we need to craft policy in Washington. And we have made progress and we're gonna to continue to do that by creating jobs tied to clean energy and uh, preserving our, our coastal buffer areas as much as we possibly can. And then making sure that uh, our neighbors and businesses understand the risk of where they build and when they build and the, the density. So thank you both very much for informing our uh, policy making and thank you to the members who have participated today. We will stand adjourned for Friday afternoon.